Many are familiar with the anti-science apologetics of Rice University chemist James Tour. But what is news to most is that his professional resume appears to be every bit as fraudulent as his preaching. He's always boasting about his papers, citations, and H-index, but due to his inexcusable behavior, his own colleagues have begun coming forward to expose how he lies and cheats to inflate these numbers often committing plagiarism in the process. What follows is testimony from three colleagues who will outline this fraudulence in pristine detail. Enjoy. Uh, so thanks so much for reaching out. Uh, it sounds like you have some interesting stories about James. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and let it rip, I guess. Uh, sure. Um, let me start by sort of explaining why I'm doing this in the first place. Okay. Uh, so... I have a lot of ties to Rice University. Um, I got both my bachelor's and my PhD from the chemistry department there. I was a postdoctoral researcher there under Nobel Prize winner Richard Smalley for a year. And then I was executive director of a National Science Foundation funded research center at Rice for five years. Um, I interacted with Jim both when I was a postdoc and when I was uh, affiliated with the uh, research center. Um, I've been following your video back and forth um, with Jim since you started it, but upon hearing the comments from Andy Barron in your most recent video, I realized that I could corroborate or even expand on some of the stories you mentioned but didn't go into detail yet. And so I wanted to see about doing that. Um, it's an interesting question though, um, why I didn't speak up about this sort of thing earlier. Um, because uh, it has been quite a few years since I've been at Rice. Um, and the the reason for that uh, really uh, says uh, something about the, the sociological dynamic here. Jim is, or rather was, a powerful individual. Um, crossing him was considered by many to be a career-ending move because he would take it personally and he would use his connections vindictively. So from a career standpoint, it just wasn't smart to speak out against him. But three things have changed now. Um, the first is Jim is finally losing his influence. Um, the way uh, he was treated at the Harvard faculty roundtable you did a video on is uh, really shows that pretty clearly. Um, secondly, I've recently left academia for industry and I'm quite secure in my career. So Jim isn't really a threat to me anymore. Um, and third, we're in a political climate now where standing up for the truth in our lives uh, has become dramatically more important than it used to be. And as ever the idealist, I feel like I want to uh, uh, follow that that ideal. So um, uh, you, you'll you'll see the connection of uh, this, you know, the uh, Jim's habits of being uh, vindictive and uh, uh, and uh, abusing his power in a uh, in one of the stories I'm going to uh, tell you. So the issue is for me, um, Jim is an embarrassment for Rice University. It's frustrating to me that he is tarnishing Rice's name by spouting his unscientific nonsense and calling it science. What I want to do here in this uh, conversation is to add my voice to the growing chorus that says, no, Jim does not represent the Rice University that I know and love. So that's, that's my motivation. Um, I have three stories about him that I wanted to share that uh, bear on different aspects of that. Um, none of them are about abiogenesis, which I know is you know what spawned this whole thing. Um, but they do speak to um, uh, the connection for Jim between his uh, his religion and his character, um, how he approaches science and his character as a person. Mm -hmm. So, great! Thanks very much for agreeing to do it. Yeah, yeah, happy to do so. So uh, the first story is um, when I was a postdoc in uh, Rick Smalley's lab. Um, I'm a co-author on a paper with Jim Tour. Uh, we were working on ways to solubilize uh, single-walled carbon nanotubes in water. And uh, so what we were doing was wrapping them with amphiphilic polymers to isolate the hydrophobic material, the nanotube, from its hydrophilic environment, the water surroundings. The paper was published that was published on this effort had Jim as a co-author. Um, but his entire contribution to that paper was to make some suggestions to Rick uh, that Rick's students had already made. 
um, there, there was nothing that, uh, that Jim had suggested that was in any way new. Now, I know this because I'm the person that wrote this paper. Um, I was, when I was working on the author list, I was told to include Jim because it was politically the right thing to do and that he was aggressively persistent and vindictive enough that we were better off just putting his name on the paper. Now, according to Google Scholar, that paper has over 2,300 citations, um, which uh, if you look at uh, Jim's uh, uh, publications list, that would put it about fifth of uh, in his, uh, uh, in terms of most cited papers that he has. Um, and yet he, he contributed nothing uh, to that paper. Um, and it makes me wonder how many of Jim's 700 plus publications are like that, where he, um, uh, he, you know, uh, wormed his way onto a paper without ever having actually contributed any, anything uh, meaningful to it. Right. Yeah. These, you know, I, this is not his own grad students that he didn't do any work. This nope. is a completely unrelated group that <laughs> he That's just right. had absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever. Exactly correct. Um, he, he had like a hallway conversation with Rick at one point. I talked to Rick about uh, what Jim's uh, uh, Jim had said in that conversation. Um, and I pointed out to Rick that, you know, all of those things that Jim said to you, uh, your, your two main students on this, uh, on this paper had already uh, pointed out to you, and Rick agreed with me on that. So, it's like, uh, so frustrating, very frustrating. Um, my second story about Jim um, this was when I was executive director of that research center at Rice. Um, one of the center activities that I helped manage was the educational outreach portfolio. We had museum exhibits. We had teacher education programs that were run by uh, pedagogy professionals from the uh, education department. We had uh, a research experience for undergraduates. We had continuing education programs. It was a very, very broad portfolio of programs that we were overseeing as part of this center at Rice. Jim had this pet project, however, that he uh, felt should constitute the entirety of our center's educational outreach activities. And purportedly, he tried to pressure the National Science Foundation, our funding agency, to make us take that program on. It's called Nano Kids. And so what was this you know, miraculous thing Jim had done that should replace our entire educational portfolio? Well, Jim had drawn skeletal structures of organic compounds that looked like stick figures, you know, the crayon drawings of people with sticks for the bodies, arms, and legs. Mm -hmm. Jim then had his students synthesize those things. Jim envisioned these stick figures as being characters in videos, games, and other educational materials uh, who would then explain science to kids. That's it. That was the entirety of, uh, of his idea, the whole fundamentally flawed idea. As though, as though making a stick figure molecule somehow teaches anyone anything about chemistry. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, from a pedagogical standpoint, who's the audience? The, uh, the stick figure characters would be appealing to elementary school students, perhaps, maybe junior high students, though even that's a stretch, but nothing past that. Who is going to understand what these skeletal structures are? Uh, typically, yeah. what's that? College students would, but yeah, yeah uh, sophomore it. level um, organic chemistry students. I mean, maybe the occasional um, uh, advanced high school student would have seen them, but mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, uh, college students. Just a fundamental disconnect that makes the entire idea not just unworthy of funding, but laughable. Mm -hmm. I mean, fortunately, we were able to get away with just giving uh, Jim some token support, but um, this stories to me illustrates the general lack of perspective that Jim seems to suffer from. You know, he has this idea, he thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread, and so everybody's funding should pour 100% of their money into it. It's it's Don't narcissistic is what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, my third story is the main one that I really want to talk about, though, um, because it it was so personally offensive to me. Um, while I was executive director of the center, 
um, I still interacted with um, my former postdoc advisor, Rick Smalley, quite a bit. He started out as the faculty director of the center, and then once that position was handed over to another faculty member, he continued to be a key contributor and a driver of the center. Unfortunately, in 2005, Rick died from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. His last year or so, and especially his last few months, showed a decline in his mental acuity. It saddens me horribly to say that because uh, he taught me so much about how to think as a scientist. During that period, Jim dug his claws into Rick mercilessly. After Rick was dead, those conversations, I'm sorry, um, he dug his claws into Rick by things like private conversations at the hospital during Rick's chemotherapy treatments. Um, after Rick was dead, those conversations were described very publicly by Jim as a conversion to Christianity. Rick's funeral uh, was among the most disconcerting events I've ever attended. Jim had taken control of the entire event, and uh, of all people, Hugh Ross um, was... Uh, the best I can describe it is as the keynote speaker, uh, as though it were some kind of faux scientific conference. I sat in attendance accompanied by multiple faculty that had known me extremely well for over a decade and who'd worked alongside Rick for even longer than that. Ross gave a speech that lauded Rick, Rick's conversion, seeing the light, as it were, um, and then used the platform to promulgate the idiocy of intelligent design. Um, the comments I heard from my colleagues aren't fit to repeat in a public forum, so I'm not going to. Um, since then, I've had numerous examples of interacting with former students and postdocs of Rick's that were unable to attend the funeral. I've described uh, to them the last year or so of Rick's life um, and this experience at the funeral, and I've uniformly received the same response horrified, incredulous shock. The picture that Jim has so publicly spread about Rick Smalley in the wake of his death was utterly unrecognizable to them, just as it was unrecognizable to me. And I'd been interacting with Rick within weeks of his ultimate uh, uh, demise. Now, is it possible that Jim, through his long hours of uh, milking his relationship with Rick during uh, Rick's waning hours, might have greater insight into his ultimate character than I do. Yeah, it's possible. I, I don't know how likely that is. Um, to, to me, Rick was a giant. He had flaws, um, but ultimately in every interaction I had with him, he pushed the edges of our assumptions uh, toward a greater understanding. He was never satisfied with theory when experiment was available. And when experiments were possible, he pushed us hard to do those experiments. Um, he, was, he was occasionally wrong, uh, and uh, I can cite several examples of that. But when he was proven wrong, he took the evidence immediately and adjusted his position. And then he began speculating, open to public criticism from everyone around him, uh, what this new understanding meant for uh, for what we were trying to do and about uh, the reality we were living in. What bothers me so much and makes me just livid is that Rick's last year or two were hijacked by Jim. And in the weakness of being close to his inevitable death, Rick didn't sufficiently safeguard his legacy against being appropriated by someone who was so obviously agenda-driven rather than data-driven as Rick was himself. Now, my personal impressions of Rick, while it matches those of his other students and, uh, uh, and postdocs in, in my conversations with them, um, that doesn't, doesn't prove that, uh, that Jim was misrepresenting what happened in, uh, in those conversations with Rick at the end of Rick's life. But I really only see three possibilities for, uh, for what could be going on here. Either Jim misrepresented Rick's positions, um, uh, and after all, the only other witness to those conversations is now dead. Or two, Jim fooled himself into believing that Rick had actually converted, 
Um, and you know, wishful thinking can go a long way towards making you hear what you want to hear. Or Jim preyed on a respected colleague in decline, successfully converted him, and then crowed about that conversion afterward very publicly for his own purposes. So if you look at those three options, either Jim is lying, he's stupid, or he's reprehensible. Yeah, or a nice cocktail of the three. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's... <sighs> I mean, to me, it's very clear. Uh, they, uh, He wanted to announced that a Nobel Prize winning scientist was a Christian. So yep. he fabricated the story and then used his funeral as an opportunity to evangelize. That's basically it. I mean, I am not willing to say 100% that it is fabricated. And one of the reasons for that is that there are um, uh, quotes from Rick during the last couple of years of his life um, that you can find that uh, uh, where he is expressing um, uh, uh, Christian beliefs. Huh. That that supports the possibility that Jim uh, Jim may have uh, have to some extent converted uh, converted Rick. Um, Still though, I think uh, the the what because Andrew told me this story as well, and and. Uh, even if any of that's true to hijack a man's funeral to basically do, right. it was like a, it was like a, it was like, you know, he's selling a book, this guy, Hugh Ross, he's basically just selling a book yeah. and they didn't even talk about the guy's chemistry. He won a Nobel prize. And they talked apparently for about 20 seconds about his chemistry. His son ended up talking about his chemistry. It's right. like the, the, the level of disrespect is off the charts with this. It is. Son. Yeah. And, and it is, uh, it has left Rick's legacy um, uh, just nowhere near what it should be, uh, uh, f f uh, given the uh, the giant of a scientist that Rick was. Mm -hmm. And and it it frustrates me to no end. Well, I'm just glad that between you, Andrew, and then we'll see who else has something to say. You know that this. Truth is finally coming out, as you say. I, you know, I, I'm not aware of Jim's influence and like how strong it has been in the past and whether or not it is waning today. But um, it's about time. It's about time the world sees what James really is. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how much can be done about it. I mean, the, there's the whole tenure system that's in place. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, eventually, bad press is uh, <laughs> may uh, may catch up. It might, yeah. I'll settle for exfoliating him on the internet, but wherever that leads, we shall see. Wow, that was pretty rough. But hey, do you want some more? Because I've got more. Here's an email from a researcher who works in Jim's bread and butter field of graphene manufacturing. They want to remain anonymous since James is such a vindictive bully, but they said I could share the email. They tell me about a paper James published in Nature in 2020 about flash graphene. Surprise, surprise, it's garbage. There is essentially no evidence they even produced graphene. The spectral analysis shows it's really just graphite and tiny amounts of graphene that are no more than what can be found in a pencil mark, since graphene is just single sheets of graphite. They go on to explain what they think James really did and point out how utterly insignificant it is. And look at that. This one fraudulent study was spun into a whole series of further reports in prestigious journals for one long pathetic hype parade. Because why, James? Flash graphene changing the world. That's right, Jimbo. The king of hype strikes again. If you insist that this one researcher must have no idea what they're talking about, the cat has gotten out of the bag elsewhere, too. And any place this paper is being discussed on Reddit or YouTube, there are plenty of people commenting who clearly know what they are talking about and agree that it's total bullshit. And they all agree on the specifics of why it is bullshit. Some of these comments go into great detail and are worth reading in their entirety. Just another demonstration of what a fraud, James is, even in his primary niche as a researcher, which makes his H-index and citation count completely fraudulent as well. 
Now there is actually a bit more to discuss here. I got a request on LinkedIn from a fellow named Andrew Barron. He used to work at Rice and is a former colleague of James, and he told me that he had some very revealing stories to share over video chat. Some of the more amusing bits involved James refusing to pay his graduate students after their third year, hijacking a colleague's funeral and turning it into a religious sermon, and other shockingly despicable behavior. But the part that was most relevant to what James is trying to pull right now was a very clear articulation of not just hype on his part, but outright plagiarism. Sadly, Andrew requested that I not share the actual video chat for reasons I did not fully understand, saying that I may quote him instead. But with the information and papers he gave me, I will easily be able to outline for you exactly what James did, and once it's completely clear, I will follow that with quotes from Andrew to confirm everything in his own words. So if you look at Jim's list of publications, there is a paper on CO2 capture published in Nature in 2014, which was later retracted. And wouldn't you know, it was retracted after Andrew Barron, at that time a professor emeritus of chemistry at Rice, dismissed the claims contained in that paper. In order to understand what this paper is about, we have to know that natural gas, although considered the cleanest and most efficient fossil fuel source, is contaminated with carbon dioxide. Venting this gas to the atmosphere increases overall greenhouse emissions and offsets the advantage of using methane over conventional gasoline. Therefore, there are major research efforts to trap this CO2 in a variety of ecologically acceptable ways. So James was funded by the Apache Corporation to design new solid absorption materials, and in 2014, he published this paper. In it, he claimed to have made highly porous N or S doped carbon materials with exceptional trapping power for CO2. But his approach to making these materials was not new. For example, take a look at figure one. The S-doped polymeric materials he's describing here had already been made previously by other researchers using identical activating treatment, which was heating at 600 degrees Celsius in the presence of potassium hydroxide. Absolutely equivalent chemistry is described in these other papers. First, here is one by Sevilla and Fuertes, published two years prior. James described his use of polythiophenes. These researchers also describe the use of polythiophenes with precisely the same methodology. Here are some electron microscope images of their materials and a table of the various materials they tested. This was not new research either. Here is another paper of theirs from the year before, about similar nitrogen-doped materials, again for CO2 capture. Then there is another paper by Chandra et al. from 2012, using similar materials as the previous paper, again for CO2 capture. These materials showed solid CO2 uptake of 0.11 to 0.19 grams CO2 per gram of sorbent at one bar of pressure. Jim's material, unsurprisingly, displayed the same properties at one bar, showing sorption levels of 0.14 to 0.19 grams CO2 per gram of sorbent. So, as you can see, James did absolutely nothing new here. He didn't develop any new materials. His polythiophenes had already been made and tested for this precise purpose. He didn't show elevated levels of CO2 uptake. The numbers were identical to previous research because his methodology was identical to previous research. We know for a fact that he copied existing methodology because he does reference it, but only for the experimental part, neglecting to discuss any of the actual content. And yet, despite all of this, James made much more extravagant claims than the previous authors. Here at the end of the paper, he states that his work was a major advance for future capture and possibly storage of this greenhouse gas. Was it really though, James, or would this be an example of hype? You know, the hype that you constantly attribute to origin of life research? The 2012 paper by Fuertes was published in a relatively obscure journal, Microporous and Mesoporous Materials. It has an impact factor of 5.2, which is fair, but not great. Nature, on the other hand, has an impact factor of 64.8. Of course, the use of high impact journals increases one's visibility and all the metrics used to determine it, like H index and citation numbers. You know, those numbers James is always bragging about? Building up his own statistics by publishing plagiarized work in more prestigious journals beyond simply slapping his name on the work of his 30-plus graduate students, does that sound like a whole flaming heap of hype?
Now, one might logically ask how James was able to take some work which had no elements of novelty and get it published in the most prestigious journal in science. Aside from poor refereeing, the trick was to propose that nitrogen and sulfur bases at high pressures were able to polymerize CO2, and this created a particularly stable form of CO2, which was easier to store. This proposal was based on some spectroscopic data, especially a band in the infrared spectrum, which was assigned to the carbon-oxygen double bond of the alleged polymeric CO2, as well as a peak in the 13C NMR spectrum, also assigned to the carbonyl carbon of the polymer. Looking at figures 3, E, and F shows that the idea was that the doping atom, nitrogen or sulfur, would attack CO2 at the carbonyl and this would trigger polymerization. That's where Andrew Barron comes in. Prompted by suspicions about Jim's research, Andrew suggested in a subsequent article that such polymerization is unlikely and theoretically implausible. The polymerization requires the presence of a Lewis acid, but none was found experimentally in the system. The first sentence of his introduction references Jim's paper, and he is basically outright stating that James did not get poly-CO2. The controversy might have died at this point if the problem had been of only academic interest, but the Apache Corporation wanted to patent the invention if there was really anything new to patent, and requested confirmation of the data, especially the spectroscopic data supporting this unlikely poly-CO2. The data could not be repeated as the peaks proved to be artifacts of the experiment, and James had to formally retract the paper. Plagiarism, hype, and fraud all wrapped up in one pathetic stunt. All right, so hopefully I was able to make this debacle relatively clear for everyone. Let's hear the exact same story from Andrew now. This first quotation will be very long because he's explaining everything I just told you. It's long enough that I won't read it all aloud, but I'll highlight key bits. Feel free to pause the video as we go and read it at your own pace. And remember, this isn't dumb old Dave who can't read papers. The ridiculous defense mechanism James and his brainwashed flock use when they want to deny any paper. I used to prove James wrong. These are direct quotes from Andrew Barron, who was Professor Emeritus of Chemistry at Rice University at that time. And here we go. So, as you can see, James and Andrew were both being funded by Apache and were having meetings with Apache while they were both at Rice. James hyped up some work he had been doing for them. Andrew and his postdoc smell something fishy and confirm that James had blatantly plagiarized some existing work on carbon capture. Andrew tries to bring this to Jim's attention, but he tries to convince everyone that his work is special based on a fraudulent or at least erroneous claim of having produced polymeric CO2 based on an NMR spectrum he had interpreted incorrectly. If you remember his misadventures with Stephen Benner's NMR spectra, it does seem like James needs to go back for some undergraduate classes in this area, as it's getting quite embarrassing for him. Again, Andrew tries to reason with Jim, but he's such a delusional narcissist that he refuses to learn anything and insists he's going to get a Nobel Prize for this garbage. So Andrew publishes a paper proving James wrong, shows Apache that James is totally full of it, so they drop the patent and James has to withdraw the paper. Again, plagiarism, hype, and fraud all wrapped up in one pathetic stunt. Would you like it summarized by Andrew a little more succinctly and clearly? This is how he wrapped up this story, and since it's shorter, I'll read it aloud. Well, it's always the hype, because everything Jim did had to be in science or nature, but some of it was like, as I say, was essentially identical to something someone had done before. And then he would claim that, oh, this is the best absorbent that's ever been made, blah, 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 blah. And it turned out, well, no, it isn't. You know, but he would claim it and somehow get his buddies to accept it in the best journals, you know. So that's an example you can quote me on, because I published the paper that refutes his work. And also, you go and look up his retraction of the paper, which he fudged why it was retracted, but it was was retracted because it was plagiarized bullshit, basically. Or half of it was plagiarized, and the other half was complete bullshit. Some of you out there might have it in you to be extra charitable to James. Maybe he just wasn't aware of the existing research on carbon capture. That would be very irresponsible of him, and make him a complete fool who has no idea how to examine existing literature before planning his research, but it would absolve him of plagiarism. Okay, fine. And maybe James is truly just an idiot who can't read an NMR spectrum, and he really did think he had produced something miraculous with the help of Jesus, which would absolve him of the fraudulent claims. Okay, fine. But has he done this sort of thing before? Has he done this sort of thing many, many times before? 
Let's ask Andrew what he thinks. It's also interesting, if you track his publications, he bounces around from different areas, and he comes in claiming he solved the problem of MRI imaging or whatever it is, and then everyone in the industry or in the field realizes he's not, and then he goes into something else. So he was spending a lot of time on nanotubes for cancer treatment, where he claimed all these great things, and then all the people in the med center over at Baylor and MD Anderson basically worked out that it was all bullshit, and then suddenly he wasn't really doing that anymore, and he'd go off and do oil and gas, and then the oil and gas industry would realize that it was all complete bullshit, and then he'd go off and do something else. This new wave he has on criticizing people for hype, you know, he's the king of hype. I mean, he's the absolute king of hype. You could cite a series of papers of his which are the absolute epitome of hype, and then you realize there's no real subsequent follow-up papers. It kind of disappears. And that, to me, is the opposite of my postdoc supervisor used to call it Sherman's March. You know, when you get a really great result, you then publish everything in the field to burn the ground, and no one else can come into your field because you've published 20 papers, which basically have done everything. Jim never does that. He does one paper, claims it's the best thing since sliced bread, and then does maybe one more, and that's it. So it seems like James pretty much exclusively operates this way. This is probably the most revealing insight into the psychology of James that I've uncovered thus far. The way he presents himself. Look at all these patents. Look at all of these areas of science that he has contributed to. Breakthrough after breakthrough. When in reality, he's had virtually none. He jumps from one field to another when he can't fool people any longer, and he is constantly plagiarizing existing work to publish in higher profile journals, which boost his visibility, so all of the bragging about his list of publications and his H index go right out of the window as well. I used to think that James was a good scientist in his own field who allowed his religion to warp his mind and push an anti-science agenda in other fields that challenges baseless faith. Now I realize that the truth is much worse. He perceives himself as an extension of his own mythological savior, bringing forth the glory of the Lord through his magnificent gift of scientific brilliance. But he's really just a sad little man who lies and cheats his way to the middle only to complain when people don't recognize him as the fictional superstar he pretends to be. Anyway, after hearing from both Andrew and Kevin, as well as other scientists who work in Jim's primary field of nanomaterials, a very clear picture has emerged of how pathetic James really is. Take all of the disgusting apologetics out of the picture. We are still looking at multiple accounts of how James lies and cheats to get his publications. Slapping his name on the work of his sweatshop of graduate students, even when he offered them no guidance, or even entirely separate and unrelated research groups, plagiarizing existing work, relentlessly slathering his own work with hype to the point of fraudulence, and any number of other sordid tactics. You have to wonder how many other colleagues will come forward and expose even more of Jim's resume as fraudulent. How much more has to come to light before Rice gives James the boot? Even with just these three testimonies, it's already quite clear that his publication count, citation count, and H-index are totally inflated and meaningless, hence the hard pivot to preaching, because it's the only realm where his audience is clueless and delusional enough to treat him like the genius he fancies himself to be, while his scientific peers know better. Who else will come forward to further expose James? Let's wait and see.